My name is Catherine Bliss, and I direct the Project on Global Water Policy here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. And it's really a pleasure to welcome such an early and energetic crowd here this morning for today's learning forum on making progress in the water, sanitation, and hygiene sectors. I have to say that the project is very pleased to be able to co-host this session with several partners, including Global Water Challenge, Tetra Tech ARD, and the WASH Advocacy Initiative. And we've really been honored to have been able to work with such a broad range of organizations in setting this up. And this includes the World Bank Group, including the IFC and the Water and Sanitation Program, the Safe Water Network, Duke University's Nicholas Institute for the Environment, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Water <laughs> Institute, and Water for People. It's really been a broad group putting this session today together, and it's been great to work with all of the different partners. So as all of you know, tomorrow is World Water Day. I think it feels like World Water Week already because there are so many activities going on. Uh, the theme this year is Water for Cities, addressing the urban challenge. And as urban populations in both the developing and developed countries grow, the multiple demands placed on water supplies pose ever greater challenges for public officials, entrepreneurs, civil society, and researchers alike. UN Water put together an interesting set of facts and figures related to the urban water challenge, and if you haven't checked out the official World Water Day website, I encourage you to do so. <coughs> Here are some of the most striking numbers. Um, half of the world at this point lives in cities. Every second, the urban population worldwide grows by two people. According to recent data regarding progress on the Millennium Development Goals, cities are doing better than rural areas in extending drinking water and sanitation services. But nevertheless, 141 million city dwellers do not have access to safe drinking water, and 794 million live without access to improved sanitation facilities. Beyond the challenge of extending service to those without is the problem of maintaining existing services. And for an interesting perspective, or a set of interesting perspectives on what this means for the urban poor in developing countries and for managers of utilities in our own country, I encourage you to take a look at the Healthy Dialogue blog maintained by the CSIS Global Health Policy Center at the website www.smartglobalhealth.org. This month, we will be featuring a series of guest blogs on global water challenges, and we started the series last week with a look at urban issues. Andy Northcutt of African Cities for the Future and Paul Gunstensen of Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor, along with George Hawkins, the general manager of DC Water, each describe some of the challenges inherent in managing urban water systems. Now, we're not focusing just on urban issues today, but I think you will find that many of the presentations and discussions will provide information that is highly relevant to the urban challenge, whether it is how to engage the private sector in water and sanitation, the implications of climate change for wash progress, or how to improve transparency and accountability in the water sector. I hope that all of you will be able to stay with us for the entire day. Uh, we will do our best to keep you well hydrated and fed so that everyone can listen closely to expert presentations, engage in lively debate, and articulate a set of recommendations for the sector. Uh, let me just give you a, a few little housekeeping um, notices or items. If you've come in and it's still raining outside and you want to hang up your raincoat, we have a coat uh, closet just down here to the right. After, after you leave the room to the left, it's over here to the right. There are restrooms at the far end of the hallway down here. For those who need a haircut in the middle of the session, uh, there is a barber shop over here. And if things get too pressing, there's a travel agency at, uh, also at the far end. So all of your needs are taken care of. We're really a, a full service operation here. Um, for those who attended last year's roundtables that we hosted on World Water Day in 2010, let me also encourage you to take a look at the publication that came out of those discussions. It, would, it was called Paths Forward for the Global Wash Sector. And you will have copies of that along with copies of publications from many of the other organizers of today on a, on a flash drive, and they're also available outside. Uh, this year, we will be putting together a similar report to capture and disseminate what I know will be a wide-ranging discussion today. And so look for that to be posted sometime later this spring on our website, httpwater.csis.org. And so now, without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to Chris McGahey who is Senior Associate in Water Resources and Environmental Health at Tetra Tech ARD. Chris will be serving as today's Master of Ceremonies, and he will provide you with an overview of today's events. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much, and welcome to everyone. Uh, quick thanks to CSIS for their years of involvement in innovative leadership in in this sector. They've been bringing people together here for the better part of two or three years, and you're all a result of that, and this whole day will be. Thanks to the Global Water Challenge for their unsurpassed ability to connect partners, implementers, and investors. And thanks to Tetra Tech for letting me sort of take the day off and come here today. And a special thanks to the WASH Advocacy Initiative for their work in communications, sustainability, and partnerships that really made this whole thing possible. And we'll recognize those people throughout the day because there's some very, very special people who are with us today. This is, to me, an absolutely phenomenal day. I've been working in this sector since the early 1980s, and I have never seen in one room the diversity of people, the diversity of backgrounds who are coming to this sector. And it's, it's just an amazing group, and I invite you to make sure that you get a copy of the participant list, which is on your tables, and take a look through that. It's really an, an astounding group of representatives from the private citizen sector, from implementing organizations, both contractors as well as NGOs. Academia is extremely well represented, as is the U.S. government. The multilateral funding organizations are very, very well represented, and the media is, is also represented here, which represents to me the elevation of this sector and the current prominence that it has. And we'd like to welcome all of those people. I'll go quickly through the agenda and then we'll launch right into the first session. Just to let you know that this day is designed to be a two-way learning session. You're going to learn an enormous amount from the panelists you'll see. All of the panelists throughout the day, in my opinion, are at the front edge of the state of the art of work in the water supply sanitation hygiene sector. They're a very forward-looking group. They're a very innovative group. And you'll learn an enormous amount from their experiences, where they are and where they're trying to go. But we've also set up the day so that it's going to be a very interactive day. Because of those of you who are in this audience, you have an enormous amount of experience also. So we're going to pull that out of you. We have several interactive sessions designed so that you can contribute back to these panelists and contribute to the sector as, as a whole. This first group, uh, we'll talk about their Smart Lessons Initiative, and that's a program to share best practices and lessons learned across regions and topics, something that I don't think we do enough in this sector, and there's been a, a, a significant investment by the organization that you'll hear from first. Right after that, we'll have a brief coffee break, and I'm going to be a very, very tough time cop, so don't irritate me. I'll just warn you right there. We'll come back for a session organized by our colleagues from the Safe Water Network. And the Safe Water Network focuses on core areas of entrepreneurship, urban service provision, realistic business models, and local ownership and participation. And we'll hear from several of their colleagues and many, uh, uh, one of their uh, field program staff is also with us today. Several of the people from Safe Water Network have come down and joined us and we'll make sure and recognize people throughout the day. Then we'll have a, a brief session by our colleagues from the Nicholas Institute at Duke University. And for those of you who didn't get a chance to, to ever see or read the 2005 silent tsunami report, this was, a, this was a major and significant document put together by the Nicholas Institute and, and the Aspen Institute. And one of the authors, uh, Hattie Babbitt, will be with us today. And they'll talk about the update that they're doing to that document. And then I'll have some tasks for you to do over lunch. Also over lunch, we'll have a flash drive available to each one of you that has over 35 documents on it that are relevant to the presentations that you'll see today. There are documents on there. There are videos on there. We'll have those ready for you at uh, lunchtime. When we come back after lunch, the University of North Carolina will lead the afternoon session about a very forward-looking issue, climate change and water supply sanitation hygiene. Then our, our final session will be hosted by our colleagues from Water for People, and they will focus on accountability and transparency, which is a, which is a very serious focus of that organization right now. As I said, we'll have formal presentation times, and then we've designed each, each one of the sessions to be slightly different, interactive, to give you a chance to get your questions out, comments out, but in a way that, that keeps us on time throughout the day. 
we're here to build on a 25-year history of what we know and really solidify a foundation for the vision moving forward. So without further ado, we'll get right into our first panelist, who it's wonderful to have here. They're a bit, if I can call you a non-traditional participant in the water sanitation hygiene sure. sector, but it's wonderful to have them here. It's representatives from the World Bank Group and IFC. I'm going to turn the session over to Dan Rundy, who is here on my left. He is the Director of the Project on Prosperity and Development and the William Schreier Chair in Global Analysis here at CSIS. Previously, Dan was the head of the Foundations Unit for the Department of Partnerships and Advisory Service Operations at the International Finance Corporation, IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And from 2005 to 2007, he was director of the Office of Global Development Alliances, which is where I first met him at the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and he led the GDA Partnership Initiative. Earlier in his career, he worked for both Citibank and Boston, or Bank Boston in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So with that combination, to me, he seems to know where all the skeletons are, where they're all hidden, and so I'm going to turn the session over to him, and we'll see how many that he'll tell us about. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming in this morning. It's a little bit rainy, uh, probably appropriate for a discussion on water. Um, the topic today for the panel is business behind the tap. Um, Smart Lessons, for those of you that don't know it, and I'll, I'll get into some of the detail, has a branded uh, approach to these discussions about various smart lessons called smart talk. So this is also a smart talk as well. Um, but why don't I first explain a little bit about the context of where IFC and the World Bank fit into this discussion on water, and then I'm going to uh, get into a brief discussion on where, what the role of smart lessons are, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. So the bank, uh, everyone's familiar with the World Bank. They're the uh, uh, they lend uh, resources to governments all over the world and provide expertise through uh, uh, various lines of uh, financing. One's called IDA, one is called IBRD. IDA is for lower income countries and the other one is for middle income countries and many of those projects pertain to the water sector and, and the public sector sense. Uh, and there's a significant engagement with regulatory agencies and what we call a development business policy dialogue. Uh, with governments on how to uh, run run their water systems most efficiently. Um, as part of that uh, conversation, there's also a, the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, uh, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which has primarily two lines of business. One is uh, lending money and uh, making equity investments. That's the investment side of the house of IFC. And then there's a technical assistance side of the house, but it's not called that. It's called advisory services. And that's uh, the advice that's provided to both governments and to companies uh, of, various, of various sources. And I think you'll hear a mix of all of these various parts of the World Bank over the course of this discussion panel about water. <clears throat> um, one of the great ways in which IFC, having used to work there, captures information and captures knowledge is through a knowledge product called Smart Lessons. And their public website is smartlessons, S-M-A-R-T-L-E-S-S-O-N-S, dot I-F-C dot org, smartlessons dot I-F-C dot org, which is a way by which originally I-F-C could share across the system because it's, a de it's now a decentralized system. Over 50% of I-F-C staff is in the field. How do you share learning? How do you share knowledge in any large decentralized organization? How do you capture learnings and how do you uh, share it um, is, is tricky, and it's particularly tricky in the development business where it's decentralized organizations like IFC or USAID or NGOs um, that learn some innovation in one part of the, part of the world and, and you want to be able to apply it to another. Oftentimes that's a very inefficient process, and IFC has, a, I think, very successfully uh, found ways to shorten the time by which learnings in Paraguay can be applied to the Philippines or to Benin and it's through this product called Smart Lessons. Smart Lessons is sort of a cliff notes, if you will. It's sort of it's a three to five page uh, quick learning. And so you're going to hear from three different authors of three different Smart Lesson notes. So this is an example of one. I think many of you have them at your, at your they're either outside or they're at your table. But I also think as part of the, the goodie bag that you're going to get, I think on the uh, on the with when the with in the you'll get it electronically or in a saved electronic version of several of the, or many of the smart lessons that are going to be discussed. 
Um, and so this is a way by which uh, we can capture learnings, and we, we're going to talk about three specific smart lessons. One is a World Bank one. What's happened over time is that IFC has opened up the smart lessons concept both to the broader bank group, uh, and you'll hear from Elizabeth Kleemeyer, um, who's a, a World Bank specialist in water, talk about her, uh, some learnings that she had from a desk study that she did of 25 different um, uh, water projects um, around the world, and then also from two IFC-specific smart lessons. But there's an opportunity. Smart lessons has been further opened up to external, uh, external uh, organizations, so you can submit smart lessons. If you're in the water community and you have a, a, a key learning that you think is uh, something you want to share with the broader water community, this is a way to do it. Just internally at IFC, something like 150 to 250 downloads for each one of these smart lessons. So think about uh, the sub-community of people in the bank system that are thinking about water. That's probably a very large percentage of the folks that think about water in the bank system are, are reading these or downloading them or sharing them. And so this is a particularly interesting tool that's available to you in the broader water community. So, at, um, so let me um, now get to the, to the uh, issues at hand around water. There's uh, only so many dollars in the public sector to fund uh, water projects. There's only so much that the public sector can do in providing access to water. I know many of you have spent uh, much of your career thinking about how can we uh, enlarge the amount of monies that go into the water sector. I think over time there's been uh, an evolution in thinking that either for reasons of scale or for reasons of sustainability that the private sector has an increasing role to play, perhaps in, mixed with uh, public sector monies or in terms of with smart engagement with governments uh, to do that, whether from a regulatory standpoint or in terms of various sorts of uh, subsidies or uh, what's called output-based output aid. And so there are various examples of these discussions in the three case studies that we're going to talk about. I'm going to ask Elizabeth Kleemeyer to start because I think her smart lesson, this is, so as I was saying earlier, this is the, the Cliff Notes version of the 25-page the desk study that also includes 50 pages of annexes. You can read the 75 pages or the, or the five pages. I picked the, the five pages. But this is, but Elizabeth, I think, has done a very interesting job of looking at 25 uh, it, it cases in the bank system and, and what we can learn about the role of the private sector and the water sector. So without, without further ado, Elizabeth, over to you. Um, thank you. Um, the reason I was able to produce the cliff version notes from the longer study is because I really have just a very simple message that I'm delivering through these um, products, and that is the private sector is sometimes a better option for managing rural water supplies than community management is. That's it. Don't even have to read the cliff version. Um, it's a very simple message. Uh, nonetheless, I think there are probably three ways in which that message could be misunderstood, so let me just uh, clarify. I did say managing rural water supplies. This is not a statement about supply chains. Um, various community management models typically and rightly assume a role for the private sector in some kind of supply chain, either supplying services or supplying spare parts and equipment. Um, what I'm talking about is a very different kind of role for the private sector. That's in managing or operating the supplies um, themselves. So the private sector is sometimes a better option for managing rural water supplies than community management is. Um, the second possible misunderstanding is that I did say sometimes. This is not about advocating some new rigid orthodoxy that everywhere and every place pri the private sector should take over from community management and replace community management with private operators. Quite the contrary. This is an attempt to get rid of a previous rigid orthodoxy that said everywhere and every place community management is the best solution for managing rural water supplies. So the private sector is sometimes the best option for managing rural water supplies than community management is. And finally, a third misunderstanding could creep in by what the private sector 
means. We're not talking about a private sector or private operators that look like the large private operators that come in to manage um, big urban schemes. This is not necessarily some French multinational that, that moves in with a lot of capital and technical staff um, to take over. This, um, this study is based on a review of 25 cases in which there have been water, rural water supplies managed by private operators. And those 25 private operators look extremely diverse. There are a few examples of big multinational firms moving in. Gabon, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso. But there are also examples that look the other end of the spectrum. Um, in Mauritania, it can be a village elder that works part-time at managing the, um, the village rural water supply. In Cambodia and parts of Vietnam, these are um, families that have invested their family savings in building a small pipe network and then run the scheme to, to supplement the family income, perhaps provide an income during retirement to um, the, the entrepreneur who has invested in them. And these private operators can be anything in between. It could be a national construction firm like in Paraguay. Um, it could be more regional-based firms. It could be local entrepreneurs. Um, by stretching the definition a little bit, in Bangladesh, we're talking about some, some local construction firms, but also NGOs. Those of you that have worked in Bangladesh probably know that NGOs there are quite commercially oriented and so sort of move into the, the private sector. So the private sector is sometimes a better option for managing rural water supply. So that's the message. I look forward to discussing it today. Um, in addition to today, the World Bank has opened an online forum for both bank staff and uh, external experts such as yourself who are interested in discussing the question and issue of how to use uh, rural public-private partnerships for um, rural water supply schemes. So if you're interested in continuing this discussion afterwards, I encourage you to come and register with me. What's the, what's, is there a website address for that? You have to register. Thank you. So you say it, yeah. water, www.water.com or something? No, it's, this, this is a, um, the, the, the bank um, computer security oh, team right. is very rigid. <laughs> so you have to register with me first, and then you gain access to the site. Great. I'm going to ask Will uh, to go next and to talk about uh, his smart lesson on thinking outside the pipeline venturing into distributed off-grid water markets. I think you're going to hear about a very interesting case called Water, water Health International, which uh, in 2004 IFC made an early investment uh, into Water Health International and then followed up with a much larger equity investment. Um, so I think you'll, you'll hear a little bit about that as well as some other learnings. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm actually based in the uh, Nairobi office in Kenya with IFC. Uh, I just come over every now and then when I, when I miss the rain. Um, and actually, unlike my fellow panelists, I, I'm only 50% of a smart lesson. Uh, this was actually a, a joint effort between myself. Uh, and actually, in Kenya, I've been very lucky that uh, I have a colleague, uh, Vikram Kumar, who he's now in the Kenya office. Previously, he was in the Delhi office for IFC. And in Delhi, he actually managed the, um, the recent IFC investments in the company Water Health International, which, which Dan just mentioned. Um, and so this paper was really an effort uh, for myself and Vikram to combine both his experiences with making investments in Water Health International in India, um, and now Water Health is expanding beyond there, with work that uh, I've been helping IFC to set up in Kenya to, uh, to basically look at how we can develop water and sanitation markets um, across the board. And as Dan mentioned, there's the advisory side and the investment side of IFC. Vikram sits on the investment side. I sit on the advisory or the, or the technical assistance side. Um, with Water Health International, actually, I noticed there's a lot of water health stakeholders in the room. Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Safe Water Network later on. They were a catalyst behind the uh, move uh, of Water Health in International into Ghana. Uh, and I also spot Mark from the Acumen Fund, another uh, investor in Water Health International. So, and I noticed they're both speaking. So I won't talk too much about Water Health International, otherwise you'll, you'll be numb by the end of the day. Um, but let me talk a little bit about, you know, the, basically the, the, the concept of... Um, um, private sector investment in smaller scale water supply services. 
Um, and so you'll also be hear hearing, I, I just had a quick look at Nicola's paper. And um, for IFC, the kind of bread and butter uh, in the water and sanitation has always been large-scale infrastructure investments uh, for the simple reason that this is where transaction sizes are big enough to get IFC interested, frankly. You know, it's where commercial investment sizes are of a scale that, that our investment departments are, are eager to, to invest. Um, uh, and therefore, this has always been where IFC's primary avenue for engagement has been. Um, the trouble is, of course, these kinds of transactions are a little limited. You know, you get, particularly in, uh, I'm coming from Africa, you don't get all that many big city PPP deals coming up that often. So there's a, there's a limit to how much IFC can do if it only focuses on large-scale infrastructure. And also, as all, as you, all of you n know very well, that this often misses the heart of the problem. You know, m most of the water and sanitation problems in the region that I work are in rural areas, they're in peri-urban areas, they're in informal settlements, which are often not reached by uh, network grid utilities, if you like. Um, so for IFC, if we're going to do more business in the water and sanitation sector, we need to look a little downscale, if you like, uh, and understand how we can help the private sector to become a bigger part of the solution in relation to smaller water and san uh, water supply schemes and also smaller uh, sanitation systems. Um, so the obvious question then is how do we how do we do that? How do we attract pri the private sector? How do we attract private finance into smaller, more decentralized water supply systems and what we call distributed uh, water supply services, which it's probably not very catchy, and so it might not catch on. But um, so this was anyway the basic subject of the paper, and it's the, and it's the heart of the, or it's the fundamental question behind what I've been working on in Kenya. Um, and frankly, it's still early days. Uh, the project that I've been working on is is really less than a year old, and so we've probably unearthed more questions than we have answers. Uh, so I'd be very keen to hear from other people when we get to the discussion. Um, but let me just uh, focus on three issues that the smart lesson. Um, brought out. As I mentioned, it's only four pages, so we only, we only got to three issues. Um, but these were, one, the need for an aggregation mechanism. Uh, secondly, the need to do a better job for all of us of blending public and private financing. Uh, and thirdly, the need to develop partnerships that more effectively crowd in the private sector rather than crowding them out. Um, and so what I mean by aggregation is basically the problem with small-scale water systems is that they're small, right? So for the private sector, that means small contracts. It means small systems generally with high operating costs and therefore limited opportunities for surplus revenues if we think about a kind of per system uh, model. Uh, so obviously to make the economics more attractive, we need to find some way of aggregating uh, the number of systems somehow. Now, in the case of water health, there's a kind of natural aggregation mechanism within the company. You know, the company, uh, just to give you a very brief background, Water Health International is a company that uh, installs and operates what they call water health centers uh, in villages and peri-urban areas, primarily in India, but as I mentioned, they're starting to expand to other countries. And so, Basically, by installing more and more systems, there's a natural aggregation within the business model. And the more systems you install, the lower the marginal cost of each new system. So, you know, if you're doing one or two or three, obviously it's very expensive. If you can get up to a scale where you're doing 100 or 200 micro water treatment systems, then, you know, the operational costs progressively go down and you've got a, you know, naturally the economics of the business model make more and more sense the bigger that you get. And obviously the challenge there and that we're coming up against with similar businesses that we're looking at in Kenya and elsewhere is how do you get up to that initial scale? How do you, you know, how do you get over those initial barriers where the costs are, are so high to get to a scale where you know, the, the economics of the model start to really make sense? Um, I mean, that's just one example. There are lots of other examples, for example, uh, uh, on when we're working with governments, for, for example, then in Kenya, there's uh, there's starting to be some interest of, 
within the private sector in community water system management. So quite small scale community water systems, you know, the, the benefits of the private sector coming in to help operate the systems, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, are, uh, can be quite profound if the, uh, if the environment is right. The trouble again is that these are small contracts for the private sector. So when you're working with governments, the question then is how do you pool contracts, for example? Uh, how do you uh, um, basically generate transactions that are of sufficient size to get good private operators in by maybe giving them access to five or ten systems as opposed to just looking at individual systems on an ad hoc basis. Um, the other kind of aggregation mechanism, if you like, when you look at smaller scale systems is to pool the construction contract with the management contract. And so then it's starting to look like a kind of build operate transfer model. And you see that the private sector are much more interested in those kind of models where the management is built in uh, to a construction contract rather than it just being a, say, a management contract, which is, you know, when we're talking about um, systems, small community systems in Kenya, you know, their revenues are maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year. So it's really not of a scale where the management contract alone is sufficient to attract the private sector. Um, I'll speed up a little bit uh, rather than take all the time. But uh, uh, number two, am I okay for time? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, the second issue that the paper touched upon was this probably predictable issue of blending public-private finance. And I think all the experience we looked at when we we're doing research in Kenya and elsewhere is that wherever private or market-based models have worked, there's always been both public funding and private funding in the capital investment somewhere, wherever you look. Uh, and again, taking the example of water health, they actually, uh, particularly during the early days, the reason they were able to get up to the scale that they've reached was because they were quite effective at mobilizing donor funding, NGO funding, philanthropic funding on behalf of the communities in which they worked. Uh, there are also lots of examples from Kenya, and I would encourage everyone to also have a look at, uh, there was a smart lesson written this time um, on a Kenya uh, WSP program where they're basically blending 40% uh, output-based aid funding with uh, equivalent matching funding which is provided by a local bank in Kenya for small-scale infrastructure in the water sector. And it was written by uh, Rajesh Advani, who's a private sector specialist in the, the WSP Kenya office. It's an excellent introduction to the question of, uh, of how to make how to encourage banks to start investing in, in, uh, in smaller scale uh, water and sanitation infrastructure. Um, and so rather than go into detail on that, I'll just refer you to that, that paper. Um, and it's an excellent program and an excellently written, written um, smart lesson, which actually got one of the first prizes this year. Uh, the, the trouble though, when you look at these examples, you look at water health is that, in most cases, it's been an ad hoc, an opportunistic approach. You know, it's been individual relationships between, say, NGOs and private companies. And the scale, therefore, is naturally restricted by the scale of funding that each individual donor can bring. So you see a lot of pilots, you see a lot of small-scale initiatives, but you don't see many going to scale because you don't see many cases in which the public funding is of sufficient scale to or is, is coordinated within a country in a way that enables the private sector to, to build models. Um, and it's fundamental to, to what we're trying to do in Kenya is to understand how we work with the government to rationalize the use of government subsidies in ways that leverage as much private financing into the sector as possible. Um, so I think that would be an interesting another interesting topic to maybe discuss further as the day develops. Um, the third issue we, and final issue we touched upon was uh, what kind of can vaguely dis be described as partnerships, but particularly partnerships that, that crowd in the private sector rather than crowd out the private sector. Um, and in the water and sanitation sector, as you all know, it, there are a lot more stakeholders than in a lot of sectors. And so this question of who does what always is, is, is particularly uh, important in the water and sanitation sector. So I think it's worth thinking about what role the private sector can and should be playing. Uh, and Elizabeth already touched on it a bit, but if we break it down, it's basically the private sector 
brings finance, potentially, uh, if the tariffs are set at a rate that, that generate some kind of return on capital. Um, then an obvious benefit of the private sector is the finance that they bring. Second is the management capacity. And thirdly is the, um, the innovation and, and technology that uh, the, the private sector brings to the table. Um, and if we look at an example like Water Health International, actually you see all of those coming into play. Uh, all three of those attributes were, were brought to the table. In other cases, you might see less than that. But I think the basic point is that in our experience, things tend to work best where we create the space and the incentives uh, that crowd in private sector finance and, and management skills and technologies. In contrast, where the private sector is crowded out, where there's uh, large amounts of concessional funding or where there's large amounts of public engagement in water uh, supply management, uh, then for an institution like IFC, it's very difficult for us to engage. There's just not the space for the private sector. Um, so those were the three issues that the paper touched upon. I hope I've at least started to introduce the subjects, and then hopefully we can uh, discuss them a little more after uh, the third presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Will. I'm going to uh, just make a comment before I hand over the, the, the floor to Nico Separiti. Um, <clears throat> Nico has written a uh, smart lesson on uh, the World Bank Group's collaboration on the St. Lucia Water Public-Private Partnership. And when you read it, it's in best bank, bank understatement is the last sentence, which I'm going to read just to, to put this in context. When dealing with a client who wants to benefit from the services and products offered by the different organizations of the World Bank Group, it is best to assume that the issue of conflict of interest will be raised multiple times and that the attitude of the client government officials cannot be taken for granted, which is sort of an interesting sort of an interesting way, interesting way to end it and, uh, and is an, an interesting sum up of a, ver of, a, of a fascinating case study that I'm going to turn over to, to Nico, which I think will be able to unpack all of the issues that, that I think are summarized in that one sentence. Nico, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, first of all, maybe a little bit of an introduction. The reason why I ended up writing uh, uh, this uh, smart lesson on St. Lucia, which is a small island in the Caribbean, is because I was involved in the water sector reform of the, uh, in, in this country at three different stages of my life. Uh, during the 90s, um, the public sector go, uh, in, uh, in St. Lucia had basically started to throw in the towel uh, uh, on, because they were not achieving the desired results uh, on, uh, on, uh, with their water utilities, and so they have engaged a British water utility on a management contract and uh, on a uh, knowledge sharing basis. And uh, so uh, in the 90s, I was involved with that, uh, an attempt to acquire this uh, uh, British utility. I was working for a, a European power utility at the time, and uh, so uh, in doing the due diligence, I found out that they had this uh, tiny little contract uh, in uh, in Saint Lucia, and uh, a little bit. I was a little bit curious about that. But five years later, when I joined the World Bank Group, I was actually with the World Bank uh, in the Latin America team, and um, yeah, Saint Lucia came up again, and I realized that uh, I found out that uh, the government had definitely thrown in the towel and had uh, requested the World Bank assistance to uh, implement a reform of the water sector and uh, uh, implement a, a public-private partnership, invite private sector to manage the national water and sanitation <coughs> company. Um, and then a couple of years later, <laughs> again with IFC, uh, we were invited by the government to implement the final stage of uh, the public, the private uh, the implementation of the public-private partnership and helping the government uh, uh, find an investor for uh, the water system. Um, if you read the, our smart, m the smart lesson that I wrote, you will find that uh, it's a little bit of an inward-focused uh, uh, smart lesson. Uh, it's written for uh, my colleagues, uh, um, for them to be able to, uh, to, uh, to learn uh, which, which can the amazing variety of tools that uh, the World Bank Group makes available for uh, interventions in the water sector, and also a little bit for clients or prospective clients of the World Bank uh, uh, to learn about uh, the same uh, things. Um, so it focuses on uh, the issue of uh, knowledge sharing within our organization, where I highlight basically how 
uh, being able to effectively uh, put together the different tools, the, pub the uh, knowledge in what the sector is to form, the loans for uh, um, uh, investment uh, if, if on the side of the pr public sector, the um, availability to finance pri private sector um, investors from IFC, the, ab the ability for IFC to provide technical advice. Um, Every, all of this is available, but basically um, it relies a little bit on uh, personal connections rather than institutional connections, or at least that was the case uh, three years ago when I wrote the smart lesson. I'm sure by now the institution has evolved and uh, there are more efficient mechanisms p to put all the tools uh, together. And the second issue was the issue of conflict of interest, which is one of uh, um, primary importance within uh, uh, the World Bank uh, group, imagine uh, when uh, a, a, a country or a city or a municipal utility asks for advice, um, we, uh, the World Bank group on, on its public site can say, uh, can approach the utility and say, we can provide you public funding and we can provide you uh, technical assistance on um, uh, basically how to improve your operations. And IFC, on the other hand, can, can approach it and say, look, you can Im improve, uh, you can implement a, 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 a partial privatization or a public-private partnership, and then we can finance it. Uh, so the, 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 those two issues come from uh, opposite sides, and uh, conflict of interest uh, needs to be managed carefully. Uh, my experience from the government side is that as um, uh, Dan uh, pointed out when I introduced my <laughs> my speech, uh, is that uh, you can you can never take for granted what the government position is. I've, I've worked on a number of uh, uh, projects uh, similar to this, and uh, I've seen uh, reactions from the government uh, on uh, uh, all spectrum. Some governments really care about conflict of interest, or at least perceived conflict of interest. Other really wants only to get the job done, and this was the case in. Uh, in St. Lucia, and they gave us green light to use all possible tools um, available. What you, the, the lesson that you will not see written in uh, my smart lesson, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, this is an ideal forum to share it, is uh, one that I've learned uh, after uh, a decade working on the, smart, um, on the water sector in St. Lucia, is that um, um, private sector involvement uh, may, uh, it's not, definitely the solution to achieve results in the water sector, but uh, um, when, gov when governments want to implement uh, a, a serious reform of the sector, giving uh, accountability to, to um, uh, regulators, to regulate, to the policy makers, to establish a long-term policy for the sector, and to the um, entity that delivers uh, um, the services, they need, or they, or more often than not, they need to reform the sector. And there's a huge amount of inertia uh, from uh, all stakeholders involved uh, um, in implementing this type of uh, uh, reforms uh, if a radical uh, restructuring of the, se the, of the sector uh, is not uh, contemplated. And, and this is why you will find that private sector involvement, uh, or especially in the case of St. Lucia, is a, a perfect excuse to do all the changes from an institutional reform, from a regulatory reform point of view, that will uh, um, that will take your water sector structure to the point where you want it to be. So, um, so to go back to St. Lucia, uh, I'll give you a, a five-minute snapshot if we have the time. So, in the 90s. Uh, um, it was basically it was uh, the Wasco. There was a no, actually there was there was uh, the water service provided <coughs> provider on the island was an agency called Wasa Water and Sanitation Agency, it was effectively a branch of uh, government. Um, what they tried to do was to corporatize it with the help of government, uh, with the help of the World Bank Group and some uh, technical as advice there. And then they hire the best uh, private sector managers or investors, uh, the brightest minds of the island, and put them on the board of directors to see if they could achieve uh, any uh, major result. When, when that failed, uh, and they tried the twinning arrangement or management contract with the British Water Company. And that worked for two or three years, but then w the contract was not renewed, and, um, and uh, well, the situation failed to improve again. 
tariffs were frozen. There wasn't a proper uh, tariff setting mechanism in place. They the utility didn't have funds to implement, uh, to finance investments. And so this is when uh, they approached the World Bank Group and they, um, they, uh, and they made an agreement for a technical assistance loan and that loan financed uh, the uh, writing uh, of uh, a new water sector uh, law uh, with the new uh, with the regulations and implementations for a tariff, for example, um, and also a due diligence, a, a detailed technical and financial due diligence on, on the water sector. Um, the result of the technical and financial due diligence, which was going on in parallel with the writing of the new water sector law and the uh, tariff setting uh, mechanism, was that. Uh, um, with the existing tariffs, uh, the, a, a public-private partnership was not uh, possible, and that uh, um, the, uh, so the company was not, uh, uh, was not financially sustainable. So again, they approached the World Bank and uh, IDA, uh, because it's a very small country, and so they, are, uh, they access, uh, I think, 50% uh, IDA, 50% uh, World Bank uh, uh, funding, and they borrowed to make the one investment that make made uh, uh, the uh, water utility bankable, which was an expansion of a couple of pipelines that um, uh, basically uh, constrained water supply to the north of the island. And um, uh, once more water was made available, uh, people started using more water, and so revenues went up. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, the company reached uh, a operating uh, profit, at least. Um, Tariffs uh, had been frozen since uh, uh, the year 2000 in nominal terms, so the company couldn't even recoup uh, inflation. So th th this is it for, uh, the, for uh, the World Bank, Bank intervention. The last uh, part that the World Bank financed was, uh, last component was the hiring of a Spanish investment bank to find uh, an investor. And they, they did indeed hire, hire uh, this uh, investment bank, um, a, a very good one, only that uh, uh, the times of uh, uh, the government approval of all these new laws and the Senate approval and implementation of the regulations were not exactly compatible, compatible with the times of uh, a private sector investment banks, which after two years waiting for uh, uh, the Senate to pass on uh, the new law, basically they canceled the contract and withdrew from, uh, uh, from, from the country. So this is where uh, IFC advisory stepped in, uh, and we uh, fill in the gap left by this uh, investment bank. Uh, um, this was uh, uh, less than <laughs> less an investment banking type of activity and more of a uh, all rounded uh, assistance uh, i would say activity we <laughs> we had to uh, work with the individual members of government to see where they stood on the on the law we had to help them find uh, uh, the papers uh, of the law when they lost them uh, between the uh, Senate approval and the formal ratification by the head of, head of government. Uh, we had them to uh, provide assistance in, um, uh, with the appointment of the regulator, in training of the regulator. And um, well, in the end, when the regulatory framework uh, was in place, we also implemented an international tender for uh, the identification of uh, uh, the, a, a private sector investor, and that was quite successful with the company in a relatively good economic shape and with the regulatory system in place, uh, uh, the government received a number of uh, good offers. Uh, the government also had the requirement that um, local uh, funds uh, would be mobilized, so we helped them uh, uh, engage in discussions with the uh, local banks and with local uh, industrial investors, namely the power utility of, of the island. And um, when the local banks withdrew from, from the project because of uh, a little bit uh, of uncertainty, because uh, we were approaching 2007, 2008 uh, financial crisis, um, IFC's investment side uh, decided to make available funds uh, uh, for the capitalization of the new company as, a, as an equity investment. Uh, and um, voilà, so.
this is a little bit uh, the end of our story. Uh, if you want to know also the uh, how this ended, uh, so with, uh, and I'll tell you why this uh, uh, really um, uh, you know, feeds perfectly into into the conclusion of my greatest uh, the lo lo lesson that I learned working on the water sector is the fact that with the water, a new water law in place, the new water tariff setting mechanism in place. A well-structured sector with an independent regulator, which was now competent because it had been trained, um, with a company that, thanks to uh, some uh, fresh capital injection from the World Bank, uh, was able to make uh, an operating uh, profit, and also with, uh, uh, if you allow me, uh, a, a f three or four uh, uh, solid uh, and very detailed uh, business plans or business proposals uh, received from uh, private sector investors, the government decided that it, it didn't need uh, private sector investors anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, basically they decided not to award the concession and, uh, yeah, to continue operating uh, with the uh, current formula. And I think um, during the last couple of years they've been pretty successful uh, at that, so. Okay, thanks. I think you've heard uh, a variety of, of messages from our three speakers. One is about the, that there is a role for the private sector in the, in the water sector. Uh, you've also heard about some new examples that Will was talking about, about uh, off-grid water markets, how, how, to, how to access the private sector in these off-grid water markets. I think you also heard about from Elizabeth that there's a broad spectrum of interventions that that include the private sector. And then I think you also heard, at one level, you heard sort of a traditional IFC um, discussion of large municipal infrastructure projects in the case of St. Lucia. Uh, and then the, uh, the political risk, perhaps, of, uh, of, of doing that in the sense that uh, there's all sorts of, one of the reasons that the private sector sometimes doesn't, doesn't invest is, is on these issues of, of political risk. And I think we saw that, that as well. Uh, it still leaves us with the challenge of only so many public dollars available for a massive need and that there's a huge gap between the public dollars that are available and that are going to be available and the need uh, to access clean, clean water around the world. One of the issues that was also touched on, and I want like each of the panelists to just touch on it if they would, is the issue of output-based aid. There's been some discussion about this uh, in each of the SMART lessons. And I know this is a topic, for those of you that follow international development trends, this has been a, particular, uh, a particularly uh, tr increasingly interesting topic uh, for the development community. So I'm going to start with Will and ask each of the panelists if they can make one, a brief comment on output-based aid, and then I'm going to turn over the floor to, uh, to everybody here, because I know there's a, there's a very knowledgeable group. Will. Yeah, and I'm sure most people are familiar, but basically output-based aid is uh, uh, aid that is paid according to outputs as opposed to inputs. So traditionally, public aid to developing countries is paid in advance. You give your government or the money or an NGO the money or whoever and, and ask them to deliver and, and if they do, great. If they don't, they've still got the money. Uh, Output-based aid is based on the performance, uh, evaluated performance uh, according to set indicators uh, whether it's number of water connections, uh, whether it's uh, number of teachers or school children attending in other sectors, then um, essentially you're, you're delivering your aid based on outputs. So the reason it's interesting, I think, is that when we're talking about public-private partnerships, it's quite a neat way of incentivizing the private sector to deliver on development targets uh, as opposed to purely pursuing financial objectives. So for example, I know output-based aid was used in, a, a, IFC was an investor in Manila Water, a large city public-private partnership where output-based aid was used to incentivize the water company to increase the number of household connections in informal settlements. So these weren't commercially viable connections unless you subsidized them. And the way you subsidized them was that you delivered uh, aid to the company based on the number of connections that it that it provided. And I described the example in Kenya, and I would again refer you back to the paper that was written on it. Um, but it's basically it's a nice way to kind of skew 
private sector incentives towards uh, the objectives that, that you as a development partner might have for a particular project. Elizabeth. Um, yeah, maybe there was a fourth misunderstanding that I should have covered as well, which I was um, very much just looking at rural water supplies, not um, peri-urban or, or urban. And so output aid, output-based aid, I did come across in some of these 25 uh, cases of rural water supplies that I looked. And I think that um, Will just alluded to what you can imagine the problem is. I mean, it's one thing to ask the private operator that's coming in to manage uh, Manila Water, which I don't actually know who it is, but I'm sure that it's a very big company that has lots of capital. And it's another thing to ask a small little entrepreneur that's just kind of thinking, well, maybe I'll get into the business of rural water supply to come up with all this money in advance, right? Because output-based aid means you get the money after the construction is done. And maybe it's not even after the construction is done. Maybe it's after you've reached a certain number of connections have been made. And after those connections have been run for maybe three months and reach 25% of the population. So that leaves the question of where does the money come from between when you start constructing and when, when you get the money? Uh, especially, as again, as Will said, you're in a situation where banks aren't lending for this kind of thing. They don't, they don't think rural water supply is a good uh, investment. Seems a little bit risky to them. So that, that's the trouble I've seen with output-based aid in a number of these projects. So where does the financing um, uh, come from? Nonetheless, there's an example in Paraguay, which admittedly I don't know that much about, but where um, output-based aid was very successfully used by um, the World Bank to reduce the level of subsidies that the Paraguayan rural water agency um, had been paying for uh, subsidies. They, the, the private companies actually competed in their tender on the level of subsidy that they were willing to um, accept in order to build the scheme. And the one that made the offer for the lowest subsidy required from the government um, did it. Those, the private operators in those cases were also constructing the schemes and they um, were, were national firms, so they didn't have this capital um, problem that faces um, entrepreneurs in, say, Bangladesh, entrepreneurs, NGOs in Bangladesh that are trying to come up with money. Nico. So, yeah, um, also in St. Lucia, we have the OBA scheme. Uh, basically, I, I think uh, two or three million dollars were made available as a grant uh, under an OBA framework. Uh, to connect uh, rural households that were not part of the uh, system uh, at the moment that involved uh, building small pipelines that went probably you know, up to 100 or 200 meters in the jungle because St. Lucia is a very a green country uh, to connect those households that basically it would have been uh, to absolutely uneconomical to connect uh, under the normal uh, framework uh, for payment for uh, new connections. And there, uh, I, I, I totally agree with Elizabeth. Um, uh, the OBA scheme was a cornerstone of uh, all the offers that we had received from uh, private sector investors because they had a lot of capital available. They, they felt they could, uh, uh, with the limited risk, achieve uh, the, the, you know, deliver the results uh, and, and get paid. But once the uh, PPP scheme was uh, uh, was uh, was cancelled basically uh, the under public uh, ownership uh, the water company no matter how well was it was managed now and no matter the fact that they had a good regulatory system in place they still lacked the basic capital to advance uh, for uh, the investments uh, under the OBA scheme and so uh, I don't think uh, that part of the, that component of the investment uh, went ahead and I think those people in the forest are still without pipe to water supply. Uh, with regards to Paraguay, I think 
uh, the o OBA scheme needs to be of a sufficiently large scale and it needs to have a su you know, sufficiently big and established brand name or repeatability so that uh, you know, financial institutions can advance the money. For the case of St. Lucia, in the case of St. Lucia, that was not possible. First of all, it was a, a tiny little subsidy, you know, two, three, two, three million US dollars. Uh, it was a brand new scheme with no credibility. So no, no financial institution would have advanced this money, uh, you know, to, to, to the water company um, to, to implement those uh, schemes. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions. I'm going to ask that folks, uh, uh, we have a microphone in the back, uh, ask folks raise their hands and, and give me their name and, their, and also their organization and to keep it in the form of a brief question or an extremely brief statement. I'm a, I follow the Chris school of uh, being, uh, uh, being a uh, rigid police person for these uh, issues, so please don't use this for your 10-minute soapbox, right? Okay, so hands, please. Okay, there's a gentleman up front. Catholic Relief Services. My question is about the uh, privatization of the small rural schemes. Um, typically, you will find in an area there'll be some schemes that work well with community management, many that do not. Now, for a private operation to be successful, it was said that one needs to have a number of schemes. The larger the number, the more financially viable it will be. Well, my question is, who decides that a community becomes part of a private scheme? Who makes the decision that it transfers from community management to private management? What role does the community have after that decision is made? Are they still having a role in the type of technology the fees to be paid, the responsibility for maintenance. The whole purpose of development is to instill a sense of ownership and responsibility. Does a private approach do that? Thank you. Maybe I'd ask Will and perhaps Elizabeth, they could take that. Will, do you want to go first? <coughs> Sure, uh, and I would say the community should be the ones that make the decision. Uh, what's interesting in Kenya is that because banks, or in the cases where banks are financing small-scale community systems, it's actually the banks, as much as anyone, who are pushing the concept of private management because they see it as a much more reliable way of securing their investment. They are not comfortable lending, and I say they, I mean this is based on some, some limited um, experience and, and primarily one local bank in Kenya, um, but, uh, and again I'm referring to the WSP uh, uh, program that, that's um, uh, underway there, um, but the experience that they've had is that uh, the, the commercial lending to community managed schemes is, is a challenge for the banks. Whereas when you back that up with a private operator, a reputable private mm -hmm. operator, there's much more of a sense of security that their loan finance is, is secure because they have more faith that a private operator is going to uh, not only have the technical capacity but also have the independence in terms of shutting people off, for example, if they don't pay, than community management uh, a community managed system might. So what we see is when there's commercial finance in the system, the incentives for private operation are, are heightened. That's not to say that this is being forced upon the communities. The community should, of course, always have the option. Uh, the question for the bank is maybe they want to make it a condition of their lending, and, and I would argue that's up to them. And if the community doesn't want the funding, then they can carry on with their community-managed approach. Um, but that, that's just my, my limited experience of that issue in, in Kenya. Elizabeth, would you like to make a comment on that? Um, yeah, there, there's quite a range of options. I mean, if you look, as I did globally, at, at 25 cases, and 25 is no magic number. It was just all of the cases I was able to identify in the, in the time I had um, for looking for cases. Um, in some countries, like in Benin and Rwanda, there's a choice. Um, the government has decided, you know, we're moving to a new management model, and they, I mean, the government, the Ministry of Water. Um, and so they will offer, like in Benin, four different kinds of contracts. You can have one that's just purely um, 
uh, private operator. You can have one in which the uh, Water Users Association hires a private operator. You can have one in which it's just the um, uh, Water Users Association that runs the scheme. So, so in that case, there's um, a choice. And Rwanda is the, the same sort of thing. It's all delegated management. There has to be some um, group that runs the rural water pipe schemes. If it's um, an entrepreneur that wins the contract, fine, and a lot of them are entrepreneurs. Um, but if it's a, a, a reformulation of an old um, community management committee, that's fine, as long as they sign the contract and accept the responsibilities and agree to deliver the services, you know, meet the benchmarks. And if they don't meet the benchmarks, then they're going to lose the contract. Um, in, in Niger, where the bank was working, um, they had to convince the uh, water user associations to turn over um, the schemes. This was under a World Bank project that I'm familiar with, although there are lots of donors in Niger that are doing the same thing. And that um, process of convincing the water user associations to turn over um, the, the work to the, the schemes to private operators held up the project for a while because these water user associations were basically corrupt and making a lot of money off of these schemes. And so there was a great reluctance to um, turn them over. But um, eventually, I think they got 50 schemes. Niger, Niger is a, an interesting case because there was um, a, a fairly well done quantitative analysis of the performance of community managed schemes versus um, these privately operated uh, schemes. And, and the management was basically much better on the privately operated one. There was still a role for the water user associations. In, in Niger, the water, as in many of these, as in Benin, for instance, um, it's the water user association that signs the contract with the private operator. In Rwanda, that was another case, it's the, it's the district government that signs the contract um, with it. In Bangladesh, they didn't have a choice. Um, it was the, the, the entrepreneur that went out and found the scheme and came up with a proposal to, to build it. So the, the community either agreed to have that and get a scheme built or they could just stay um, like, like they were. In Gabon and Morocco, I find those very interesting cases because for so much of my career, we were saying utilities couldn't manage rural water schemes. And those are, are two cases in which it's, an, it's in a utility that's very successfully expanding into um, rural areas. So um, again, you know, that, that in that case, it's already um, been decided uh, by the government that, that these areas are within um, the the, the perimeter of the utility company. So I would just say it's, it's, it's quite a variety. I would also say um, that for a long time we've been saying that what's important is ownership of this scheme. But let me steal the idea of Peter Harvey, who's written about this at great length. He's now with UNICEF, but used to be with um, Swansea. Is that that, that place in, that writes? publishes a lot on water supply. Anyway, Peter Harvey um, made the point, is it really ownership that we're worried about or is it willingness to pay for the water and maintain the scheme? Do we really, I mean like, for instance, I don't really care whether or not I own WSCC, WSSC. You know, I want the service and I'm willing to pay for the service. So isn't, isn't um, instilling in rural people and giving them the, the, the desire to maintain the service through making their contribution to that service um, important. Also, as I remember, um, if I haven't forgotten over these many years, it was you, Mr. Warner, writing about Malawi who, s who said that these schemes would not be maintainable uh, the Malawi Rural Pipe Scheme, perhaps the most famous participatory community-managed um, rural water system in, um, program in the world, that these schemes would not be maintainable under voluntary community management, which was the CM model that was being produced there, because that undervalues the labor, the value of the labor of um, the community members that they 
simply you know, have all of this time to walk the pipeline and clean storage tanks. And indeed, 25, la 25 years later, that's exactly what we saw, that a voluntary-based village management structure for community management of the Malawi rural pipe schemes didn't work. Okay, uh, gentleman sitting at that table there. <coughs> Uh, good morning, Joe Raza, Water Resource Sustainability for Coca-Cola. Uh, I'd be curious to see with these schemes, you know, I mean, obviously there's a global reset in expectations on private sector water users, indus industrial water users, and uh, we're also quite keen to manage our water-related risk. So I would be curious to hear the pa panel's point of view for what the role of industry would be, industries that are, are present in these areas or potentially would want to be in those areas. Elizabeth, you want your, why don't you take a crack at that first, Elizabeth, maybe if well, other panelists want to talk. Um, I don't think Coca-Cola has a um, strong presence in rural areas, because <laughs> I was looking at places, I mean, these, I wasn't, again, the fourth misunderstanding. I wasn't talking simply about the edges of large towns. I was talking about real rural areas. So um, I'm not sure that I've ever heard of, of some place like Coca-Cola being there, but I have seen other things like um, maybe agricultural processing thing, um, things or even a cement factory um, located in those areas. I mean, I'd say there's a great role for them, particularly if they pay their water tariffs. <laughs> and and in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, commercial, commercial uh, tariffs, like in any water system, that's a great way to keep the rates down for other people, particularly poor rural people um, that might not um, be able to, to do it. So, uh, you know, what I saw in these case studies, plus um, a mission I did for the bank in Vietnam, was the, um, the mistake of the particularly community managed schemes to not get the tariff right for these commercial things because I think you should pay a lot of money for that water. Um, and the, you know, the tendency was to kind of say, oh, a little bit more than, than what a, a rural household um, would pay. I think that's the best I can do with answering your question. You know, I mean, if I, if I can yeah. have a little yeah, comment please. here. Um, you know, I mean, for example, you're gonna see significant increases you know, what you might think is corporate social responsibility and investment, it's going to be a dramatic increase <coughs> in the next few decades in what private sector industry wants to do in terms of engagement to support the sustainability of resources. I think most industry would tell you tariffs are no issue. Um, in fact, they're incredibly low around the world, too low, and, and unsustainable funding is the result of that. But so, I mean, you know, in, in um, output-based aid, for example, private sector industries may have a role in the initial seeding of those. I'm trying to spark some creativity. It's not just about the, the tariffs, but you know, how can we be more engaged productively to help those communities to support the sustainability of the resource to make these solutions economically viable and sustainable? Yeah, I know that Coke and, and Chevron, I think, both have programs on water. I can't remember how many how, I'm looking at Sharon Murray, who's in the audience, and there's a relationship that Coke and AID have a, I don't know, how many people you reach, Sharon, between Coke and, and AID together now? A mil, is it a, half a million people in how many countries? 23. Right, 23. So <clears throat> these sorts, in, in the case of Coke, it's a, it's a bit, this is central to its business, that this is a, a part of, and it, you, you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people beyond providing a beverage, and I know in the case of Chevron, I know this is also a, a critical issue of, of reaching access to water. So it may be that the subsidy that, that we've been talking about may come from grants from private sector actors, or you may see companies that aren't in the, the, rural, uh, the rural utility business be making equity investments in, in companies. You could see that in the future as part of either as a CSR initiative or something that's part of a social license to operate initiative, perhaps, right, along in, in the future? I mean, a lot of big companies with big agricultural poles, I mean, you can't even think about what their main product is. I mean, it would need a massive supply chain, so I think having a rolling stock. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, other, other comments? There's a gentleman in I, the... Can I add just... Yeah, add, yeah. Um, just one thing is that um, 
you know, I, the Water Health International, by the way, is one of the case studies um, in here. So, um, but with, with that and a few other exceptions, I don't think the idea that um, getting the private sector involved in, in managing rural schemes has paid off as a way to get private sector financing. Um, and that's not surprising because it really didn't pay off in the urban water sector either, that the private sector's been a lot better at bringing management skills and technical skills and not so much a source of investment. And when you turn to looking at these very small uh, rural schemes, that, that's true several times over. And then when you add on top of that, that the banks don't want to lend either, um, you're not going to see a lot of private firms bringing in capital because they want to make a profit through rural water supply. But if there's a firm that wants to bring in money because they think it's a good thing to have rural water supply and they're really willing to help you know, put in place a financially sustainable management model, I think that would be a great role for the private sector. Well, I'm going to just ask, before we go to that gentleman in the back, maybe you can make a comment, and maybe Nico, if you've got any comment about this, I'd, I'd welcome that as well. But Will, first, then Nico. Uh, look, uh, again, to refer back to uh, the case that I presented before, we had the issue of in solution of managing uh, the hotel association. As you know, it's a powerful, uh, uh, yeah, uh, powerful local lobby. They use a lot of water for swimming pools and for uh, rooms, way more than uh, the per capita consumption of uh, the households around them, and they have a lot of money. So uh, throughout the you know, decade in which I worked on the water sector in Seleucia, there's always been this looming question, what do we do with them? Uh, yeah. So uh, the, 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 there, I can say it was extremely an extremely controversial issue. Uh, to the, the, the what hotel association would have been more than willing to participate in the shareholding of the company, but then the public was opposed to it because they say, oh, you just want to hand over the management of our water supply to the people who will hoard the, uh, the, the available water for their own uh, purposes. And then uh, uh, financially, uh, they were already paying two or three times more than the average household, but that made very little difference on the average tariff level. Uh, so in the end, uh, they ended up uh, uh, being invited to uh, uh, be present on the board of directors of the water company and to share uh, knowledge with the managers of the water company on issues like uh, you know, revenue management or financing, or this kind of stuff. Well, yeah, just um, briefly on that comment, it's, it's not quite related to the sustainability issue, but what we are seeing in Kenya is that the market for industrial water efficiency is actually one of the catalysts for general private sector interest in the water sector. For example, we've got, we're working with a few private operators whose actual core business is water efficiency work with horticulture producers, with other, primarily agribusiness because it's Kenya, not so much big industry, but, but that's certainly a key driver of the market for water companies, whatever, and usually they're quite diversified. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit of a, um, slightly off the top off the topic of the question, but a, just an observation. I think, and I would defer to Elizabeth's general experience, because um, she quotes about 15 countries, whereas I'm able to quote one. Um, but what we are seeing in Kenya is that there is bank financing going into infrastructure. I, I, I would certainly agree that generally the private sector management seems to have been more effective than private sector bringing financing. But we are seeing both better run urban utilities accessing market financing and the example I've been giving of rural systems uh, market financing blended with, uh, with output-based aid subsidies, which I will Im certainly admit is early days and that model has yet to be proven. But um, I think from our IFC perspective, there's certainly we're, s we're pursuing the, um, uh, the idea that, that private financing can be, um, can be leveraged in, in the water sector. Okay, the gentleman in the back. Uh, my name is Zach Cahalan, and I'm with Evergreen International Aviation. And my question is uh, mostly directed at Will, but anyone can feel free to chime in. I'm not terribly familiar with Water Health uh, International, uh, but I understand that they're mainly based out of India. And in a country like India or, say, Bangladesh, where your rural population uh, just count 
is probably higher than your average rural population in, you know, pick a country in Central or North Africa. Um, do you anticipate WHI or a comparable company being able to overcome the whole economies of scale issue that you alluded to, um, period, or A, in an in a ample amount of time, and if not, what thoughts have you had preliminarily how to address that issue? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, I think it's it's fundamental to what we've been grappling with, and actually what Safe Water Network have been grappling with with their work with trying to help Water Health uh, access the Ghanaian uh, market. And I think fundamentally, there's the Water Health model. There's there's some basic drivers. One is uh, the population density, so you need quite high uh, population densities within a village uh, so that you have a, a captive market in, in one area. Uh, there's relatively easy access to water, so you don't have huge expense in, in your extracting from your, whatever your water source is. And then there's the socioeconomics of the consumer. There's, there's a willingness to pay for clean water within that area. Um, how many sites in Kenya fulfill those kind of characteristics, we're not exactly sure yet. And we're actually doing some market research at the moment, actually in partnership with Safe Water Network, to try and answer some of those questions. Um, because, and what I would imagine is that the models that work will be very much adapted to different circumstances. So we're not trying to pull a model out of India and plant it into an African village and like a spaceship and hope that it hope that it somehow works. But you know, what are the characteristics of the local market that will make these kinds of similar kinds of distributed business models work in different environments? But I would agree it's it's more a more difficult market, certainly. The, w the woman up the woman up front here. Kendra Sam with Booz Allen Hamilton, um, and I apologize if you already went over this. I was late thanks to our virtual system. Um, <laughs> have you seen an increase in um, private sector involvement in market-based water fund projects where downstream users pay for upstream stewardship? I think the signature example is in Quito. Um, I don't know too much about it, but I'm just wondering if you've seen an increase in projects like that. Elizabeth, do you want to take a crack at that? I'm not as sure I understood. You mean like they're paying the, 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 the consumers of a rural pipe scheme or something are paying for like watershed management? Exactly. Is that what you? Um, you know, in my 25 cases, I didn't come across that. So um, I don't think I should say anything more. Others? Uh, the gentleman in the corner there. Uh, Brooks Keen from CARE. Um, certainly with, uh, with community management of, uh, of rural water schemes, we've seen some of the issues you're talking about with transparency of uh, financial management. And I'm curious, and uh, I guess this is mostly for Elizabeth, in your case studies, uh, how have you seen that that problem gets overcome uh, with private sector management of, uh, of rural water schemes, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you'll have lack of uh, information and educational level in communities it might lack the sort of information to, uh, to hold uh, private sector or community uh, management scheme uh, of schemes accountable. Um, you know, the danger about talking about something like this is that you tend to, um, first off, start sounding like an advocate that this is a really great thing that always works, and then sort of by constant repetition, start thinking that you're an advocate um, for it. So uh, in in the paper where I don't have those kind of pressures, I'm much more balanced in saying, well, you know, this looks promising. There have been some cases where it works. There have certainly been some cases that I also document where it doesn't work. So it's more like we're on the cusp of something here. Um, let's keep working on it, you know, and and but uh, keep monitoring it. Where it where it's worked well, and I'd say Burkina Faso is a great example, it hasn't been um, it hasn't been just going in and putting in private operators. It's been part of a whole sector reform uh, process that went on, and that's a lot involved a lot of training. The water and sanitation program has been very much part of it, and it's been setting up um, 
structures to enforce accountability so that, for instance, um, uh, you know, that the district government that's supposed to play, perhaps, again, I've, I've said the point that there are many different ways institutionally you can arrange this, but let's say if the, the district government is supposed to play a role that, you know, you have better district government information about what their role is, you're much more clear. Their, their contracts, their well-written contracts that spell out what's supposed to happen, who's supposed to do um, the auditing. In a number of cases, um, that's involved the establishment at something you might call like the the level of the the region. If we're talking about a district or a commune-based thing, then then some sort of regional level where you set up um, and you know contract the private sector perhaps to run a support function to support both the district governments and the water user associations and the operators. Now, having said that, that doesn't sound very good, right? Talk about conflict of interest, having one support group um, help everybody um, out. But, um, you know, there's a ways to go, but, you know, there's promise. Um, uh, this Vernier Hydro having, which is the Burkina Faso model, that's the international um, French manufacturer of uh, Vernier hand pumps, which I'm sure everybody in this room knows about. And so they're working with their local affiliate to, um, try and get, help them run eight, um, eight schemes. So some kind of franchising model. I mean, it's not that exactly, but sort of moving towards that idea of a, of a franchising model where the more experienced big company helps um, a, a lower company. And in that case, you kind of get to see the um, sorts of technological innovations that Will was talking about because it's being driven by the need for that local company to turn a profit um, and so they're innovating in things like, you know, how, how they transmit um, financial data from the individual schemes to the central office in Burkina Faso um, in order to do better auditing and better management of their costs. Uh, the woman over there. Um, my name is Rabai Srivastava. I'm a PPP project manager. Um, I'm curious, you touched upon OBA measurables. Um, can you talk a little about assessment tools, case studies, issues you've come across, um, possibly very creative solutions, moving benchmarks, just kind of curious what you've come across in terms of assessing for OBAs. OBA assessments, measurement evaluation. Nico, you want to take a right? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you the hard one. Yeah, no, look, <laughs> I think, uh, um, yeah, the OBA group was set up at the World Bank uh, as, a, as an ex experimental unit to demonstrate and collect uh, that, you know, OBA schemes could work and collect evidence uh, so that this, then this evidence could be shared and spread and uh, OBA could become a commonly accepted way to uh, distribute subsidies or to achieve uh, the intended goals of uh, policy goals of government or developmental institutions. Therefore, I would refer you to the OBA website, where, <laughs> 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 where, o o exactly, right. where all this information is uh, nicely collected and presented in the most uh, accessible way. I could just add that the last time I was in a panel discussion like that, I threw out three issues for further discussion, one of which is how are we going to uh, measure whether OBA is effective or not? Okay. Uh, Last question, this gentleman here. James Diet with GETF. Um, we've done a lot of talking. I think a lot of the questions here have touched on the water sector. And I was wondering if, as this final question, you might be able to talk a little bit about the sanitation sector and the opportunities for the private sector to enter sanitation. Well, do you want to start with that? Maybe, Nico, do you want to? Actually, in Kenya, we've got a great example of a very similar distributed service model for sanitation, which is extremely well known now, the ICO toilet. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's, there's 
basically one major company in the market. So we are looking at doing some work with WSP and also the PPP department of IFC to understand, you know, how can we develop more formal concession frameworks for what are essentially, for those who don't know the model, municipal paper use sanitation facilities, which actually in urban areas in Kenya are quite good business. Uh, the question is how do you take that model and uh, apply it to areas where the real sanitation problems are, urban slums uh, and so forth, and potentially using OBA funding to help encourage the private sector to go into those kind of uh, more challenging sites where they don't have access to sewerage networks, water networks, so the costs of the business are higher. Um, so that's the kind of parallel, and it's mentioned actually in our paper as a, a sanitation example of a distributed uh, service model. Um, Kenya, fortunately for me, happens to be one place where it has kind of taken off. I mean, it's not a, it's not a panacea for solving um, sanitation problems in a country, you know, it doesn't solve the issue of household access, shared toilets still under JMP classifications don't qualify as improved sanitation, and in some cases, rightly so, there are big safety issues around using shared sanitation facilities in, in urban Kenya, um, and so forth. But uh, as a, as a organization with a private sector mandate, it's certainly an interesting opportunity, and, and I guess watch this space, it's something we're trying to work on, and, and we'll hope we'll... Uh, uh, maybe come back next year and, and report on it. Elizabeth, Nico, when do you want to comment on this issue of sanitation? Um, I, I can't offhand think of any of the rural water supply projects that I looked at that included uh, sanitation. I do know that Water for People has a great example of the private sector in sanitation in um, Malawi, in Blantyre, I believe, and I think they're on the program for the afternoon. Sorry, we have to we have to cut, we have to cut this short. And Nico, do you have a you want to make a no, look at, at it from uh, the perspective of large uh, urban uh, systems? Uh, this also presents a bit of a conundrum. From a transaction advisor perspective, it's, these are often the easiest projects to implement because you always find, uh, you know, an investor that wants to build a large technological facility that is a wastewater treatment plant. On the other hand, it's very difficult to find somebody to pay for it because uh, it's an economic externality. So, Just I want to uh, give one last plug to Smart Lessons at smartlessons.ifc.org. If you want to contribute a smart lesson to IFC, I'm just thinking is, I'm not sure who the, who the right point of contact would be. Would you be uh, Abiola, who's in the back there? Her hands are, is, is raised. And so if you have a smart lesson you want to contribute to IFC, please contact Abiola, who's in the back. Thanks very much. Please give a round of applause to this panel.